The seated woman of Ketal Hayak was made around 5800 BC, and is one of the earliest representations of what appears to be childbirth that we know of. One thing you might notice is that she is not lying on a bed like most who give birth in the western world today. Instead, she is sitting upright, with a recently birthed baby between her feet, suggesting that she went through labour not on a bed, but a type of birthing stool. Moving forwards to 2nd millennium BC Mesopotamia, birthing chairs are known to have been used there too, and written records tell us that only after labour would a woman retreat to her bed for 30 days of rest and isolation. This 30 day period of rest would have helped reduce postpartum contamination by others. In the modern world, 41% of all modern deaths among children under 5 happen within their first 28 days of life. Although of course this wasn't the reason the Mesopotamians gave, they attributed the custom of isolating the mother to female uncleanliness. The ritual isolation was believed to make her clean again. Moving to ancient Egypt, the process of childbirth seems to have happened in a similar way. The mother would stand, kneel, crouch, and use birth bricks or a stool, as is stated in a papyrus held in Berlin. As to this noble god, when he was delivered upon his birth brick, his placenta came down and was put in the river. And a text from Deir al-Medina also supports the theory of ancient Egyptian women relying on birth bricks. As a workman, believing he was being punished by the goddess Meret Sega, claimed, I sat on bricks like the woman in labour. There is only one ancient Egyptian text which possibly discusses a woman laying on her back during labour. A 7th century BC document known as the Papyrus Brooklyn, it describes a woman laying on her bed whilst a spell is cast upon her. Spell for the protection of the bedchamber of the parturient, i.e. woman going into labour. N born of N lies on a mat of reeds while Isis is at her womb. Nephthys is behind her, her Thor is beneath her head, Renenitus is beneath her legs, and Ipetweret makes her protection. Regardless, the hieroglyph for a woman giving birth is a kneeling woman with the head and arms of an infant emerging beneath her, lending credence to the idea that this was the standard image of childbirth in ancient Egypt. After the birth, an ancient Egyptian woman would go through a period of isolation similar to that of the Mesopotamians, although this time it was only two weeks instead of 30 days. When the two weeks were up, the woman and her child were introduced back into society with an accompanying celebration. In 6th century BC India, the physician Shushruta left detailed scientific records of pregnancy and birth, which seem to have involved women laying on their backs during childbirth. When labour begins, a fruit with a masculine name should be given in her hand. Her body should be anointed with oil and washed with warm water, and she should be made to drink largely a gruel made of articles, which exert a beneficial virtue at the time. Then she should be laid on her back on a soft and sufficiently spacious bed, her head being placed on a pillow and her legs slightly flexed and drawn up. Four elderly ladies with paired fingernails and skilled in the art of accouchement, and with whom she feels no delicacy, should attend and nurse her at the time. After birth, the body of the mother should be anointed with the Vala Tyla and treated, both internally and externally, with a decoction of vayu subduing drugs. If still there be any abnormality in the condition of the doshas, i.e. the discharge of vitiated blood, the mother should be given to drink a lukewarm solution of treacle mixed with powders, and the medicine should be continued for two or three days, or longer, if necessary, till the disappearance of the vitiated blood. When the discharge gets normal, the mother should be made to take for three days a gruel, yavagu, prepared with a decoction of the drugs constituting the vidri gandadi gana, and mixed with clarified butter of a yavagu prepared in milk. After that, a meal of boiled sali rice and a broth made from the meats of Jangala animals boiled with barley, kola, and kolata pulse should be prescribed for her, taking into consideration the strength and the condition of her appetite. The mother should observe this regimen of diet and conduct for one month and a half after delivery. After this period, she may be at liberty to choose any food to her liking and revert to her natural mode of living. A mother, after parturition, i.e. labour, should forego for a considerable time sexual intercourse, physical labour, and indulgence in irascible emotions, etc. And the idea of impurity after birth was also present, although in this case it wasn't just the mother who was impure after the birthing process, but the father as well. The length of impurity depended upon caste. According to the Gautama Sutras, written around 600 to 200 BCE, the Supindas, a word that specifies a group of people related in a specific way, become impure by the death of a relative during ten days and nights, except those who officiate as priests, who have performed the Dikshani Yeshti, or initiatory ceremony of a Srota sacrifice, and those who are students. The impurity of a Kshatriya lasts for 11 days and nights, that of a Vaishya 12 days and nights, or, according to some, half a month, and that of a Shudra a whole month. The rules regarding impurity caused by the death of a relative apply to the birth of a child also. In that case, the impurity falls on the parents or on the mother alone. Then, later in the same text, a man who hears of a Sapinda relative's death or of the birth of a son after the 10 days of impurity have passed becomes pure by bathing, dressed in his garments. 
Shushruta's approach to childbirth may have influenced the ancient Greeks, although magic played a more significant role in Greek medicine, as did a certain cold pragmatism. In Pompey's House of the Surgeon were found many menacing looking obstetric instruments for the purpose of dismembering stuck foetuses, if the need to save the life of a mother arose. Seranus of Ephesus' Gynaecology describes the normal labour around the 2nd century AD. For normal labour, one must prepare beforehand a midwife's stool in order that the labouring woman may be placed in position upon it. In the middle of the stool, and in the part where they give support, one must have cut out a crescent-shaped cavity of medium size. What Seranus is describing is, of course, a birthing stool, but a bed was available as well. And two beds, one made up softly for rest after delivery, and the other hard for lying down during delivery. How these were used is also described, and when the accessible part of the chorion attains the size of an egg below the orifice of the uterus, if the gravida, i.e. pregnant woman, is weak and toneless, one must deliver her lying down since this way is less painful and causes less fear. If, however, she happens to be strong, one must make her get up and place her on the so-called midwife's stool. The labouring woman would also have the help of some other women in much the same positions as were prevalent in ancient Egypt. There should be three woman helpers, two of them should be at the sides and one behind holding the parturient woman so that she may not sway with the pains. But, if the midwife's stool is not at hand, the same arrangement can also be made if she sits on a woman's lap. However, the woman must be robust, that she may bear the weight of the woman sitting upon her and be able to hold her firmly during the pangs of labour. The midwife should sit down opposite and below the labouring woman, for the extraction of the fetus must take place from a higher towards a lower plane. There seems to have been some debate as to the best position for a pregnant woman. But to make her kneel, as some have deemed good, renders it both difficult to work and undignified. And the same is true of having her stand, as Heron required, in a pit so that her hands might not work from above. For this is not only awkward, but also impossible in second floor rooms. Therefore, the midwife, with legs parted and bending the left one forward a little to make it easy to work with the left hand, should sit down, as has been said in front of the labouring woman. And after the birth, the woman took three weeks of bed rest. In Imperial China, they had a somewhat different approach to childbirth. In her final month of pregnancy, a woman set up a tent or arranged a hut. This could be set up inside the house, but couldn't just be screens around a bed. There were rules around how it had to be erected. For example, it couldn't be placed on fresh-cut wheat stalks or under tall trees, as that was considered bad luck. Birth charts dictated the direction the hut should face and where the placenta should be buried, and by the 10th century AD, placement issues had become so complex that the birth charts had to be hung up inside the birthing room. When labour began, the family moved away the beds and tables, spread grass in three or four places on the ground, and hung down ropes to tie a piece of wood to them, making a horizontal beam for the labouring woman to lean against as she squatted. Female midwives held the woman by the waist from behind, and she would only be laid down on a bed in cases of exhaustion or complications. Whilst this was going on, the husband's place was to perform magic rituals in order to ensure a successful birth. To ensure a safe birth, he could feed his wife his charred and ground fingernail clippings, or a concoction of his roasted pubic hair mixed with cinnabar paste. When the birth was over, relatives would bring pig liver to celebrate, which was probably an improvement on the fingernails and pubic hair. Once again, the mother was confined to her bedchamber for 30 days after the birth, and she was considered polluted until this period was over. In Tudor England, a woman wealthy enough to do so confined herself to her bedchamber in the final months of pregnancy, sprinkling her sheets with holy water, closing windows, plugging keyholes, and drawing the curtains against daylight. Once labour began, it was a woman-only event, taking part in the master bedroom or, for poorer families, an area partitioned off for privacy, perhaps near a central fire. The man's role was to go nidgeting, i.e. calling the midwife and the woman's close female friends and relatives, who would attend on her during the birthing process, keeping her calm by distracting her with news of the goings-on in the world outside her bedchamber. These women were referred to as godsips, which became the word gossips. After having given birth, Tudor women were known as green women, regarded as unclean, and for a month she wasn't allowed to look at the sky or the earth or meet another person's eyes. When the month was up, she would be churched, led from her bedchamber to the church porch to be given clean status. If she was too unwell to undergo this, the priest might also visit her at home. Death rates giving birth this way were high. Women would write their wills when they discovered they were pregnant, and despite the precautions of the postpartum confinements, the lack of hygiene involved in childbirth led to many deaths. Whilst it's hard to be certain of general maternal death rates in this period, a 16th century case study of the Oldgate area in London revealed a death rate of about 2.35 deaths per 100 pregnancies. 
Considering how many children a woman might have in her life, with some women having seven or more children, this meant that roughly one in seven mothers eventually died in childbirth. It was a risky business, but things were about to become riskier. In the Western world today, most women give birth on a bed, not standing up or kneeling as was seemingly prevalent in prehistoric, ancient, and even medieval societies. So what changed? This change can be traced back to the 16th century, when modern obstetric surgery emerged in France. At this time in history, obstetricians had a low social standing, and they were entering a traditionally female domain which saw midwives dominate. In order to challenge this hierarchy, they developed a disease-oriented view of childbirth. Childbirth had always been considered dangerous, but it wasn't until then that it began to be seen as an actual disorder. Obstetricians set about to convince women that pregnancy was an illness, and that it required them to lie passively in bed whilst the obstetrician wielded various unclean instruments in order that he might actively deliver her baby. This view of childbirth as an illness took root quickly with the publishing of Jack Gilmo's Childbirth or the Happy Delivery of Women, and with it became prevalent the practice of making labouring women lie back on a bed during childbirth. In 1668, the obstetrician Francois Morisot, a surgeon under Louis XIV, published his book The Diseases of Women with Child and in Childbed. His book reflected the by then popular view of pregnancy as an illness needing to be cured by men, and put emphasis on the bed as the best place for labour. The bed must be so made that the woman being ready to be delivered should lie on her back upon it, her head and breast a little raised so that she be neither lying nor sitting, for in this manner she breathes best, and will have more strength to help her pains than if she were otherwise, or sunk down in her bed. By the end of the 17th century, the bed was the usual place to give birth in France for all but rural peasant women. The success of the Chamberlain forceps proved persuasive, and although midwives fought back against overzealous forceps wielding physicians, the obstetricians gradually won the battle. And by 1899, when Joseph Bolivar de Lee opened the Chicago Lying In Hospital, he argued that childbirth was a medical process with no place for midwives, and the obstetrician led efforts for bed based births with delivery by forceps had won. De Lee's was not the first such hospital, of course, and Paris's 18th century Hotel Du, the original Lying In Hospital in France, which had 1,200 beds and a large maternity section, makes explicit the human cost of the shift to a disease centered idea of pregnancy. Demand in the hospital far outstripped availability, and the women were often forced to share beds, sometimes giving birth side by side. The death rate to childbed fever was between 2 to 8 per 100 deliveries. At the time, this was around 10 times the death rate to childbed fever of pregnant women outside the hospital, and nobody had any idea what caused it, with some thinking it was the mother's milk having gone bad. Others came up with alternate hypotheses, where the fault almost invariably lay with the dead women. Perhaps they had worn tight petticoats in early pregnancy, or maybe their vaginal fluids had poisoned them. Nobody suggested it was the fault of the doctor going from patient to patient carrying bacteria on their hands and instruments, until the mid-19th century Hungarian physician Ignaz Semmelweis mounted an ultimately futile campaign to get doctors to wash their hands before examining patients. Despite a massive reduction in the death rate at his own clinic, he failed to convince his colleagues, and in America a similar campaign from Oliver Wendell Holmes met resistance, with one critic announcing, Doctors are gentlemen, and a gentleman's hands are clean. Eventually, Joseph Lister's 1860 pioneering of antisepsis ensured sterile surgery and helped bring down death rates, but it wasn't until antibiotics became widely used in the 1940s that the death rate finally plummeted having stood at one death for every 200 pregnancies in the 1930s. Never before in human history has childbirth been safer than it is today, and the hospital now plays a much more central role in childbirth than it ever has. Whereas in 1900, around 5% of American women delivered in hospitals, now that figure is at 99%. However, perhaps we still have something to learn from our ancestors. A recent meta-analysis showed that women who give birth in positions other than lying on their back, such as crouching or standing, tend to have shorter labours with fewer caesareans and epidurals. In 2010, the Royal College of Midwives in the United Kingdom produced a report entitled Get Her Off the Bed, continuing their centuries-old fight against the domination of obstetricians. Other changes include the abandonment of postpartum confinement rituals. Now that we have won the war against many childbirth illnesses, few take a month off in bed after childbirth, allowing them to immediately rejoin society. However, the effects of this on the mental health of postpartum mothers are debated by academics, with various studies showing conflicting data on the effect that postpartum confinement has on mental health. So what do you think? Should we return childbirth to its feet? Are we forcing those who have just gone through a birth to become active again too quickly? Leave a comment below with your thoughts, and if you want to see future content from this channel, remember to subscribe. And if you want to support the channel further, check out my Patreon in the description below, and I'll see you next time.